Hello, welcome to the Fantastic Fiction and KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. Everybody, everybody have a beverage? Is everybody in? Good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is Matthew Kressel. I am the co-host of the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series here with Ellen Datlow. Thank you all for coming. We're super excited to have you all here tonight with Paul Tremblay and John Langan, two of my favorite authors. Uh, such a great crowd. We're always happy to have you here. The Reading Series is now the second Wednesday of every month. It is always free. All we ask is that you buy a drink and tip your bartender. Your bartender is working hard to keep you hydrated. So please, please, hard or soft, buy a drink. You support the bar, you support the series, you keep fantastic fiction running in perpetuity. So thank you. Uh, yes, so our first reader tonight will be Paul Tremblay. Do we have any announcements, by the way, Ellen? Do we have anything to announce? We have a GoFundMe, so our series, it costs just like a little bit, a smidge every month. If you can support us, go to kgbfantasticfiction.org. Even if you don't want to support us, you want to get on our mailing list, uh, kgbfantasticfiction.org. Click on the newsletter link, click subscribe. We send like two or three emails a month just to remind you of the reading series. Also follow myself or Ellen on Twitter and other social media, and just, you can just get announcements about the series. Uh, and our GoFundMe, if you want to, you could, you could support the series. It costs us just a little bit each month. So if you can, if not, no worries. We, we love to have you either way. Just drink, yes. Just support the book. Uh, so our first reader tonight is Paul Tremblay. Paul has won the Bram Stoker. British Fantasy, and Massachusetts Book Awards, and is the author of The Paul Bearers Club, Growing Things, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, A Head Full of Ghosts, and the crime novels, The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland. His novel, The Cabin at the End of the World, was adapted as the major motion picture Knock at the Cabin. His essays and short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and numerous years best anthologies. He has a master's degree in mathematics and lives outside Boston with his family. Here's Paul Tremblay. Oh boy. <laughs> Height challenged. Okay, <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, you know, thank you everybody for coming. You know, thank you Ellen and Matt. You know, it's an honor to be here. You know, especially to be reading with you know with my dear friend John. Um, if you talk to John later, please be nice to him. But don't, <laughs> but don't get too close. He has scabies. <laughs> John, when I say you have scabies, I'm really saying I love you. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so I'm going to read from my from a novella that's coming out this summer in my collection called *The Beast You Are*, uh, and the novella is the title novella. But before I do, just a brief word about my day in lovely New York City today. Um, it started with my getting off at Penn Station or at Monahan. You know, I had to find that first. Uh, then I sort of underestimated my two-mile walk with like a 30, 40 pounds pack. Uh, walking past, walking past a busker who said, "Hey, you want me to lift something heavy for you? Fuck you, buddy." Uh, <laughs> didn't say that. And I had a lovely drink before this event with, with Ellen, 
And she said, you look a lot grayer than the last time I saw you <laughs> seven months ago. <laughs> so I'm really glad to be here. Holy shit. <laughs> All right. I got that out of the way. Okay, the beast you are. I timed it. 18 minutes. One. There were other first ages before this one. Oh, and you should just be pre-warned. This is an anthropomorphic animal novella. There are talking cats and dogs and shit like that, all right? There were other first ages before this one. Two, the morning of the ceremony, there were three children who didn't know their names would be called later. Mag was a dog, an athletic spitz, spitz mix, eight years old, bright-eyed, soft-mouthed, with thick chestnut fur. Mag ate her usual oatmeal breakfast at the kitchen table with her parents. She attacked the bottom of an orange ceramic bowl with a serious spoon. Mom pretended to read a dissected newspaper. Dad leaned on the counter, interrogating a cup of coffee. Mom and Dad were nervous. Mag was too, in theory. Mag knew her classmates were already at the commons, planting family flags and claiming the best picnic spots. She wanted to be there, she wanted to be there chasing a frisbee with her friends. She daydreamed about how she would outrun them all. Can we please go early? I'm done eating, see? Mag held up her empty bowl like it was the winner's cup. Dad tilted his head, glasses slid down his whitened snout. He said, there's no need to be in a rush. Today is a solemn day. Today is a dreadful day for some. Today is a dreadful day for many. He amended himself one more time for most. Mag said, but not for all. She knew it was a horrible thing to say. The truth of it was the horror. Mom frowned and looked more sad than angry and said, your ears are always up, Mag. A saying normally uttered when Mag was being cheeky or a pill. I know, Mag said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. Both parents raised brows and ears, silently questioning how she meant it. Mom said, we'll leave in an hour. I know you want to be with your friends, but there's no need to be early. Mag slumped shoulders, a silent protest. The kitchen smelled pleasantly of cinnamon, honey, and apple. Dad shuffled to the table, wincing at his dysplastic hip. He scratched the top of Mag's head and placed her empty bowl in the sink. The kitchen also smelled of more complex animal smells, ones that could not be described in a thousand hundred lines of poetry. Mag still imagined she was at the commons, outrunning everyone, outrunning everything. Toll was a toad, 10 years old, with six siblings. He was the youngest, skinniest, shortest, quietest, fond of small hats and red stockings pulled over his gentle webbed feet. Toll blinked frequently, as though forever in disbelief. He loved being with his family, especially when he didn't disappoint them. But he preferred the company of books, the thickest ones he could find, even if he didn't understand all the words. This morning, Toll spent extra time in the locked bathroom, tilting a blue beret over his forehead, a slash of color in the mirror. Still getting ready, he said. His impatient father, a river dock foreman, a boisterous bullhorn of a toad, bellowed, you cannot live life afraid, and then laughed an infectious laugh for most, but not for all. Toll did not think fear was a choice. He blinked more rapidly, even though he was the only one who could see him. His sister Penn, 12 years old, was already outside, miming hopscotch on the grass, shouting to the open bathroom window, come on down, it'll be okay, my Tolly. When Toll didn't open the door, Dad left for the commons in accordance with the fevered will of his other children. After a short time of grace, Mom gently rapped on the bathroom door. She was older than most moms and had seen more, which was why Toll assumed she was so kind. He opened the door, the beret twisted in his hands. She held out his favorite book, Tolliver's Travels, and said, we'll find a perfectly shady spot so you can better read this. I don't wanna go. Neither do I, to be honest, but we have to. Toll said, I am afraid. I am too, said Mom. She always shared with her youngest son. Merith was a cat, 14 years old, an unknown mix. When asked, she made claims to Ragdoll and Rex, among others. Her father had often accused her of being a liar and worse. Orange splotches mottled Merith's black and white fur. When the younger children at school stared, she stared back until they looked away. Sometimes she told them her fur-covered skin was a map to a faraway magical place. Other times, when she needed a reaction different from boring old wonder, she told the children their skins were maps too, 
and one day she would collect them, every single one. <laughs> Early morning prior to the ceremony, Merith had one of her father's antique village maps dating from the prior first age, unrolled on the floor of the great room. The yellowed parchment was as tall as she was, was as long as she was tall. Dad wouldn't even know the map was missing. Lately, many things in their large empty house had gone missing, including an ice pick with a crow skull handle, an assassin's dagger, the blade as long and sharp as another lie. Merith kept most, but not all, trophies and secrets behind a loose baseboard in her room and a trick panel within her bedroom closet. At night, she took the dagger out, mimed parries and thrusts, twisting, turning, slashing, stabbing, learning what it could teach until the hungry, hungry blade grew tired of her games and tasted her blood. Stephen Graham Jones does the same thing with knives in his house, just like that. <laughs> a quote unquote esteemed council member who greased as many palms as he shook, dear old dad, slept off his pre-ceremony debauch alone in his locked bedroom. Three, uh, where am I skipping to? Actually, we're skipping three, four. <laughs> uh, the ceremony officially began at noon. Revelers arrived at first light, villagers dressed in their finest except for the cult of on, the spelling's important, A-W-N, the cult of on adherence, who wore monochromatic robes, the colors correlating to enlightenment level achieved, and they carried white latex masks to wear later, featureless but for two eye holes and a small mouth slit for breathing and whispered conspiracy. Most villagers did not engage with cultists during the ceremony, ignoring their longtime friends and neighbors, because the cult used this day to aggressively recruit their growing numbers impossible to ignore. With permission from the mayor, the council, the Rotary Club, the pernicious cult of on, the academics, the writers and actors guilds, the farmers, assorted labor groups, including the loggers, smiths, carpenters, and electricians, Spire the Archivist opened, this opened the afternoon long ceremony, marking the beginning of the end of this first age. Her speech, neither flashy nor falsely modest, detailed her momentous discovery of the previously unknown first age. The applause was neither reverent nor enthusiastic and was somewhere in the disinterested middle. She thought, no one appreciates the great and terrible yawn of history. Everyone gathered in the commons had only a mind for the monster. Throughout the afternoon, the villagers shared food and drink and nervous well wishes and aphorisms, promises of brighter days. In the bustling common, a temporary market filled baskets, mugs, and empty pockets. Performers plied their arts on ramshackle stages. The old complained about what entertained the young. The plays, songs, and dances were earnest, anxious expressions of joy, and there were biting satires and melancholic laments. The hope we associate with art and expression faded with the daylight hours, as though the shadow of death would lengthen to encompass everyone on this day not some nebulous future day that could not be seen or believed. Mayor Gib Grime, a gray squirrel who favored an obstinate monocle that refused to remain properly pinched between brow and cheek, his stentorian voice gone reedy, said, the names I will read have been determined by a lottery overseen by esteemed council and union heads. As is decreed, only residents under, the age, under 18 years of age are eligible to mark this final day of the first age. And by doing so, their selfless sacrifice preserves our future ages. Mayor Gib Grine paused when he didn't intend to. The duration of the pause grew as though the gravity of silence was self-sustaining. Later that evening, he would weep while his wife Dit held him. And he would swear he didn't mean to drag it out like a carnival barker. After the pause, one that spelled his political doom in a recall election 37 days after the ceremony, Mayor Gib Grine announced the three finalists alphabetically by last name. Within the crowd, gasps of horror, relieved sobs, curses directed at their witless acquiescence to what was and would be, a terrible secret joy that good fortune viciously continued to smile on the smiled upon. Some villagers collapsed to their knees in thanks, some in shame. Parents hugged their children, their children gone still as stone, under the gorgon gaze of truth, the monster finally real to them, even though it had yet to arrive. From two isolated families, tears and shrieks, and a repeated word, a command, negation, desperate plea, no! The cultists folded their heads into their masks, 
through which eyes bulged greedily, triumphantly. They linked arms in ecstatic, hopeful, fervent anticipation of a prophesied end. Five, at the northern edge of the commons, the three children were to stand on a brick dais and face the north woods. Toll's wailing mom and siblings engulfed him in quivering limbs. Dad shouted, threatened, and had to be restrained. Toll blinked, and he blinked, and he said he was sorry, but no one heard him. He gave his mom a kiss, and then he gave his blue beret to his sister, Penn, and whispered, it'll be okay. There was still a chance he wouldn't be chosen by the monster, but it would never be okay. He pulled his red socks up to his knees and wondered if the red would attract the monster. His walk across the common was long and lonely. The first child to take their place on the dais, Toll stepped onto the circle-shaped engraving on the left and blinked some more. Mag ran in circles, saying, what did I do? Did I do something? Mag's mother slowed her down and said through tears, be brave, keep your ears up. Dad told her, you run if you can. If you get the chance, never mind any of us. We're not worth it. Mag had to be pried away from her parents and carried by village police, two brawny Rottweilers and one warthog with a missing tusk. Mag was squirmy and strong, impossible to hold still. She stopped resisting when they allowed her to carry the frisbee she chased all afternoon. The disc was as yellow as the sun once was and maybe would never be again. She stepped onto the triangle on the right side of the dais, her legs twitching, itching to run. Yes, Merith was afraid, terrified, really. At the announcement of her name, her legs went liquid. A bowl of electricity pooled in her gut. Merith was also thrilled. Something interesting was finally happening to her. As her father, Councilman Ford Graham, pounded his narrow chest, pulled at bent whiskers, shouted the fix was in, demanded a recount, and oh, that hammiest, hackneyed, clod-hopping actor had the gall, the temerity to say, no Graham would be chaff. Merith held her paws over her mouth, yet could not keep giggles from spilling out. Her father was an odious, ridiculous creature, one grafted together equal parts, family money, ignorance, aim aimless, lazy cruelty, born to cheat and went in a broken system. But it didn't mean that dumbass doth protesting too much and too baldly wasn't right about the fix. Regardless, Merith sprinted nimbly to the square in the center of the dais. She bowed with a flourish of her arm and tail and a wink for daddy. The promise of revenge boiled in her heart. The cultists shouted a name, the secret origin of which they claim to keep and honor. On. Six. The sky shaded purple above the hulking wall of the northwood trees. If the dazed and sleepy insects of early spring made any sounds, they could not be heard. The three children faced the darkening wall of the northwood trees. They could not be heard. The villagers cried and held each other and consoled and rationalized and said, there was nothing we could do when they covered their eyes and said, we can't watch and tell us when it's over and peeked through their covered eyes and whispered, maybe this time it won't come. Maybe this time it won't come back. And a few wondered, what would we do then? Merith said, where's your hat, Toad? Toll blinked and answered sincerely. I gave it to my sister, Penn. She'll keep it nice. He always answered sincerely, even to questions that didn't need to be answered. Merith said, you gonna play? You can ask it to play with you, dog? Ooh, maybe throw the disc like a decoy, hope it chases? Mag wanted to growl. It came out of wine. She looked at her clutched frisbee, and for the last time in her life, felt like a child. Merith said, if it chooses me, I'm going to fake like I passed out. Oh, dear. As it puts me into its mouth, and then it'll be all bite, scratch, and scratch, bite, and bite, scratch. Its tongue, gums, tonsils. I'll open a red line down the back of its throat, and it'll taste its own stupid blood. She didn't say, but thought, maybe if I drink its blood, I will live. Her tail wavered like a cobra, ready to strike. A rumbling rumor passed through the Northwood. The villagers chorused a held breath. Cultists inched forward to be a little closer to eternity. Rhythmic tremors shook the grounds, percolating screams like kettle whistles. Fuck you on, Merith shouted. <laughs> Mag snickered and thought, run, 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 run. Toll smiled, resigned to not belonging here. The rounded shadow of a rogue mountain had lost its way and fogged over the sentinel line of the Northwood. Branches and limbs cracked, infant leaves shuddered, loosened and plumed, clouding the infant night. Trees swayed and bent and reluctantly parted. The monster, amorphously bipedal, a Stygian protean mass adorned with the detrius of living forest, 
green, mossy, long hair obscured its eyes and maw and stalagmitic teeth, which existed in the long memory of middle age and older villagers and in everyone's nightmares to be. Swinging arms, birthing zephyrs, it glaciered to the dais and to the children, grinding the earth under its bulk, the scarring terrible and final. Villagers staggered and fell to their knees. Mag's parents held paws and watched their daughter's quivering legs and tail and lost hope for her and for everyone. Toll's father wept and squeezed his children tightly to his chest. Toll's mother whispered, please. Councilman Ford Graham chewed on his claws, fretting over possible outcomes, though unlike the other parents, he had a hunch the monster would not choose his child just to spite him. Cultists mimicked the movement of the monster and they opened silent mouths behind their masks as wide as their faces would allow, praying their god would do the same and swallow everything. Seven, the monster bent, eclipsing the night, falling over the children. Its breath smelled of heat and decay. Toll thought it might be ill, that it might not live much longer. He was sad for it and sad for everyone, and the sadness momentary filled his heart. But fear drained it again, as fear always had. Its breath smelled of epochs and ruin. Mag searched for its eyes, through the tangled, matted nest of green fur. It was important to see the monster seeing her. She could outrun it if she knew exactly where and at whom it was looking. She could outrun it if she could dodge the first long, low swipe. Its breath smelled of delirious, bargainless, gluttonous animal fear. Maybe Mara smelled Toll and Mag and the rest of the village. Her father once told her fear greased the world's gears. The first and last time in his life he wasn't full of shit. Merith extended her claws and shouted, fucking decide already. The monster bent lower with speed, elasticity, and grace as fanciful as its size. A previously camouflaged neck telescoped the giant head. It hovered two and a half elephant trunks away from the children. The gravid mass fissured, a jagged crack split, oystered open, revealing its teeth. Oh, its teeth. Plague yellow of ludicrous size and chaotic formation, Sharpened cones, spines, needles overlapped, an eager crowd shouldering for space with thick foundational blocks blunted by chewing, gnashing, gnawing. Oh, it's teeth, puzzle pieces that shouldn't fit together. The cultists were blissfully horrified by the privilege of the toothsome night. Mag could not run after viewing an apocalypse. Toll hyperventilated and swayed, a wheat stalk waiting to be scythed. Merith hissed as she heard a voice in her head the same as her own voice, but not the same. I choose you. The monster recoiled its neck, stood at its previous height, looming over the dais. Some villagers allowed themselves to hope the thing would return to the northward without eating any of the children. Others feared, and cultists prayed, the monster would reject their blood offer and would soon rampage the village. The monster swung one mighty arm, a blurring, whooshing pendulum that wiped toll away from his circled spot. The village wailed, briefly unified. Mag fell backward, then slowly crawled toward the monster, making herself watch until there was nothing to see. Merith slumped, unable to understand why she was disappointed in another broken promise. The grieving moon rose, empty and staring blankly as the monster receded into the northwood. Eight. The monster's plucking, squeezing hand battered Toll to near unconsciousness. Perhaps, it's easier for us to believe the fleeting moments of his remaining life were mercifully confusing, disjointed, a dream in which he was both flying and falling, jumbled kaleidoscopic images, the sky dappled with star streaks, the forest canopy rolling in waves, distant desolate mountains, and a dark yawning cave with teeth, didn't fit together, didn't make sense. I'm sorry to say, at the end, the shrinking, shriveling essence of Toll understood this was all real, terribly real. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna, oops, we're gonna take a break for about 10 minutes. So while you're um, waiting for the next reader, go ahead and order a drink, either non-alcoholic or alcohol and tip your waitress well, or your bartender, sorry. Uh, and see you back here. Thanks. <laughs> We're gonna start to... <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh-oh, the mic's closed. The recording is closed.
Welcome back. Hello, everybody. We're starting the second half. Are you going to sit down or not? You can sit down. It's all right. <laughs> you don't have to. Sorry. Um, just so you know, the next few months, some of the readers we have coming up are June 14th, Nathan Ballingrud and Dale Bailey. <laughs> July 12th, we have Michael Sisko, who is here right now. Yeah! And David Surface. August 9th, we have Steve Berman and TK. <laughs> Uh, September 13th, we have Benjamin Percy and Josh Roundtree. October 11th, we have Livia Llewellyn and Robert Levy, who are both here. Uh, November 8th, we have Cadwell Turnbull and Victor Manabo. I think so, and that's what we have so far. So please come back next month and every month after. Our next guest tonight is John Langan, who is the author of two novels. Yeah, yeah, give him a le give him a big hand. <laughs> and he looks curiously around. <clears throat> He's the author of two novels and five collections of fiction. For his work, he has received the Bram Stoker and This Is Horror Awards. He's one of the founding members of the Shirley Jackson Awards and serves on his board of advisors. He lives in New York's mid-Hudson Valley with his family and worries about bears roaming the woods behind the house. <laughs> His latest book is Corpse Mouth and Other Autobiographies. Please welcome John Langan. All right, settle down, you filthy animals. <laughs> Hecklers, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just wait, Livia Llewellyn. Just wait. All right. No one ever forgot that KGB reading. So Paul Tremblay, in his continuing efforts to harass me, um, announced that uh, we would be reading tonight and uh, together, and that he would be reading a new story, and I would be reading my manifesto. Um, <laughs> And it turns out I had actually written a manifesto. <laughs> so ha ha, Paul. Um, before I read my manifesto, let's lock the doors. <laughs> it's 60 pages of very, very small type. But it seems appropriate in the KGB bar to read a manifesto, you know? Um, I, should, I should just before um, I... I begin manifestoing. Um, I, I should say what a, what a pleasure it is to read with Paul and a privilege and also how thrilled I am to be back here after yeah many years away. It still feels weird to be in, uh, in large groups of people. Uh, I may just run out the window any minute. Now. Um, but thank you to Ellen and to, and to Matt. Um, and I agree, if you can kick any money their way, I know, I know times are hard for everybody. Um, but I feel like a lot of times, things like this, they go under, and then everybody's like, oh man, if only I had contributed. Don't let that happen, right? Just contribute, five bucks, come on. All right, so this, uh, I'm not gonna read all of this. This is a story, um, some years ago, uh, I don't even know what this press is. Anyway, they did a, um, <laughs> Dark Regents Press, they did a hard, they wanted to do a hardcover copy of my second uh, collection, The Wide Carnivorous Guy and Other Monstrous Geographies, which seemed like a good title at the time. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Chris, Chris Maury, one of the Maury's, the, uh, um, who published it was like, oh, can you give me an extra story? And I was like, sure. So I, I turned in this ridiculously long story. And, um, and at first he was happy about that, and then he read the story and he was less than happy. <laughs> and, he, uh, and he said to me, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I kind of like it, but it's like every, you know, just when I'm getting into it, like this weird stuff happens. And I was like, I was like, hey, listen, it's fine. Um, and uh, oddly that worked. <laughs> so he just, he just kind of gave up, I suppose, you know? Um, Sound effects? It's, uh, I'm just updating Facebook. Hang on. 
It's uh, hashtag blessed. Yeah, you know, living my best life. You know. Okay. Hashtag yeah. <laughs> no, that's the hashtag from you. So this story is called The Partial List of Monster Scenes and Adverbs That Will Not Appear in My Next Story. <laughs> I'm not going to get through all of them. One, zombies. Do I even have to explain this one? I do? All right. <laughs> Look, as currently envisioned, the zombie is not all that interesting. Yes, I'm referring to the version of the monster deriving from George Romero's seminal Night of the Living Dead and its sequels and imitators. Uh, it lacks personality, which I understand is the point. As Clive Barker once said, it's the liberal nightmare. You want to love the masses and they're trying to eat your cat. <laughs> Certainly, distrust, if not outright fear of, uh, of the group dates back at least to Shakespeare, Coriolanus. But isn't it a tad flimsy a frame to build a monster around? What you tend to wind up with in zombie narratives are survivalist fantasies, with The Walking Dead playing a role that could have been filled by any number of society-ending calamities, from Super Plague to Asteroid Strike. Who wants a monster that's so interchangeable? Attempting to focus on minutiae, minutia, such as the exact cause of the zombie phenomenon, or whether people have to die before joining the ranks of the undead, or whether the zombies are slow or fast, seems to me a cosmetic remedy to a deeper problem. In this incarnation, these monsters are supposed to be corpses returning to horrifying cannibalistic life. One of them should be terrifying, a group of them caused to run screaming. Everything about them should be wrong, from the way they move to the reaction to the world in which they're once again moving. Instead, they're little better than stumbling opportunities for target practice. Sure, some writers have made them work, either by developing the zombie into something more than a simple reanimated cadaver, uh, C.F. David Wellington's monster trilogy, or through sheer brilliance of style and character, C.F. Colson Whitehead's Zone 1. The existence of a questionable shape, however, or the gospel according to Z, does not change what is for me the zombie's fundamental blandness. This next part's in parentheses. Of course, were the zombie conceived in different ways, it might have more potential. You might take the premise of Poe's facts in the case of M. Valdemar as your starting point. Do you know the story? It's about a mesmerist who puts a dying friend, the eponymous Valdemar, in a trance, which he maintains through Valdemar's death, arresting his consciousness in what has become his corpse. Poe first presented the story as a piece of fact, another of his hoaxes. It picks up on a concern that appears in some of his other stories, especially Lygia, namely the exercise of a strong enough will might keep us from being claimed by death entirely. In this case, it's the will of the mesmerist that binds Valdemar to his failed body. Poe concludes his story with the mesmerist uh, heeding Valdemar's pleas and releasing his friend from his sway, whereupon the corpse deliquesces. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so suppose you were to take the root of this story, the person kept from absolute death via some form of hypnosis, and make it the basis for your zombie. Maybe it's a woman, early 30s. She's undertaking therapy to reckon with the lingering after effects of a childhood distorted by trauma which have sabotaged her relationships, romantic and friendly, throughout her adult life, including marriage to the man who made her happier than any other she'd been with. There are events, incidents, from her early life that this woman, whose name is Deborah Price, can bring to mind with painful clarity that she struggles not to recall too often. Together, she and her therapist, Dr. Yvonne Hawkins, have wrestled with these memories in the doctor's office on Founder Street. While they've accomplished much in working through Deborah's past traumas, it's become increasingly evident that there are a few significant gaps in her recollection. Specifically, the entirety of her eighth year is lost to her. The rest of her memories are signposted with details that point towards the missing span of time as critical to understanding what's come after. After some discussion, Dr. Hawkins has suggested employing hypnosis as a means to excavate Deborah's buried experience. As the therapist is not proficient at hypnosis, she has recommended a colleague, Dr. Willis Spark. Deborah has agreed to the plan of action and the new doctor's involvement in it, and on a Tuesday afternoon in mid-June, the three women meet in Dr. Hawkins' office. Deborah is tall, 
slender, her skin milk chocolate, her long black hair tied in a thick ponytail. For the session, she has dressed in comfortable clothes, a Fuji's TV t-shirt, jeans and sneakers. Dr. Hawkins is also tall and thin, her pale skin acne scarred across the cheeks, her light brown hair cut short. She wears a blue tunic with black leggings and a necklace of large blue beads. Of average height and weight, Dr. Sparks appears smaller next to the other women. Her skin is whiter than her fellow therapists, her hair dyed platinum and contained in a bun on the crown of her head. She greets Deborah wearing a pastel blue pantsuit and a white blouse. Introductions are exchanged, hands shaken. Deborah settles into the overstuffed chair that is her preferred location for her sessions. Dr. Spark discusses her method, the words she'll employ, the way Deborah will feel, is perhaps starting to feel now, calm, comfortable, peaceful. And Deborah realizes the process is underway feels herself slipping from consciousness into another state, one in which Dr. Sparks' voice tells her she is in control, where nothing can hurt her because she is in control. Picture the screen of a desktop computer, she tells Deborah. On the screen, there were folder icons, each with a different number beneath it. Those numbers are the years of Deborah's life. Look for the folder with an eight below it. Double click on it. A window will open and there will be pictures in it, maybe a few, maybe more. What does Deborah see in there? Unbeknownst to Deborah or either of the doctors, her brain's cortical communicating artery has a sizable bulge approximately midway along it, a saccular aneurysm. Congenital, it has not caused any problems for Deborah until this moment when it ruptures, pouring blood into her brain. Immediately, her system crashes. The doctors register this as her head slumping forward, her body sliding lower in the chair while she releases what sounds like a deep sigh. They assume, however, that Deborah has retrieved an image from the missing year whose effect on her has been overwhelming. Since her eyes remain open, since her head tilts in the direction of Dr. Spark, asking her what she's seen, the therapist's error is understandable, forgivable. Neither of them has any way of knowing that Deborah Price has passed directly out of this life into another state. She herself perceives the transition as a flood of darkness, which rushes out of the computer screen she has been picturing. In an instant, she is submerged in it. This should be the end for Deborah. And through the darkness enveloping her, she sees an opening in the near distance, a doorway to a shadowed hall. Closer at hand, though, she can distinguish Dr. Hawkins' office, Dr. Spark and Dr. Hawkins, although the women, the surrounding office are dim, as if viewed through a heavy black veil. Both the doctors are speaking to her, but their words are muffled, hard to distinguish. Everything has grown very confusing. It's as if she's in the middle of a migraine except that her head isn't pounding. Between the space of the office and the door to the dim hall, there's something else, a photograph. One of the images Dr. Spark asked her to retrieve, it's small with white borders, a Polaroid. Where the picture should be, there's an inky liquid leaking onto the floor. The sight of the oozing picture provokes Deborah to panic. She lurches up from the chair, falling on, Lee's, on legs, rendered amnesiac. Her arms flail, her head twists. The therapists assume she's seizing. They grab for her arms, telling her everything's all right. Their voice is high from stress. For a long moment, Deborah has no real control over her limbs. She thrashes in the darkness that has swallowed her. The doctors hold on her arms a distant fact. And then the darkness thins, drains from the air. The therapist, the officer, clearer, brighter. Deborah is able to speak, says, it's all right, she's fine. The women release her. Control of her body returned. Deborah sits up in time to watch the blackness which had wrapped her sink into the office carpet. She cannot see the door to the shadowy corridor, but she is aware of it as a kind of lateral vertigo. Nor is the bleeding Polaroid visible, though she has the uneasy impression that were she to concentrate, she could make it appear. While she is less confused than she was moments ago, Deborah is in no state for further therapy. 
Dr. Hawkins wants to call an ambulance, Deborah refuses, and her ability to recall the day, date, and her personal information buttresses her assertion that she's fine. To both doctors' questions as to what her memory showed her, she answers nothing. If, I, if neither Dr. Spark nor Dr. Hawkins believes this, they do not press the matter. They help Deborah to the comfortable chair, advising her that over the next few days she may start to remember things, details, sights or sounds, possibly more. Uh, sights or sounds, possibly more. Should this occur, she may find it upsetting, traumatic. Dr. Hawkins is a phone call away. She writes her cell phone number on one of her business cards and passes it to Deborah, who almost drops it from fingers whose dexterity is not all the way returned. Deborah understands that she is not going to see either of these women again. She does not share this insight. She passes Dr. Hawkins the check she pre-wrote, shakes her and Dr. Sparks' hands, thanking them for their time and apologizing for, the, uh, apologizing for the added drama, and departs the office. At her back, she feels the darkness that sank into the floor slither after her. In the chaos and confusion of Deborah's seizure, Dr. Spark forgot to release her from the hypnotic state in which she placed her. The therapist will not remember this until she's returned to her house in Rhinebeck on the other side of the Hudson. She'll wonder if she should phone Dr. Hawkins, ask her to contact the patient, only to reject the idea, assuming that Deborah's response to the memory that was exposed jolted her back into full consciousness. For our purposes, she's wrong. Close parentheses. I'm going to read a little, number, number two is a bit longer, but I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. Two, vampires. <laughs> I'll grant you, given the continuing presence of the vampire in fiction, film, and even video games, this choice might seem a tad strange. What can't you do with the vampire? That's the point, though. If the zombie is bland, then the vampire has become familiar. No longer the animate corpse drawn first to the throats of its loved ones, then to whoever is available to slake its monstrous thirst. The vampire has cleaned the dirt from beneath its fingernails, combed the worms from its hair, and assumed the role of trope for our enduring fascination with youth and beauty, with wealth and power. It's as if the evening wear in which the monster once stepped onto the screen has overtaken and consumed it. And to be fair, what I'm complaining about has its center of gravity in movies and TV shows. Uh, a novel such as The Golden uh, can pick up this figure and run with it, suggesting an undead satyricon within the walls of its vampire stronghold, turning the figure on itself. But it's a tricky conceit to handle. Instead of critique, what tends to emerge is infatuation, which leads to soap opera of the more conventional and less interesting sort. I can't help but thinking of the end of uh, Nina Auerbach's quirky study, Are Vampires Ourselves?, where she laments the rise of what she identifies as the post-Dracula predatory vampire and longs for a return to the monster as it was portrayed in a number of mid-19th century English plays uh, as a kind of companion, even a friend. I'd say she got her wish. The vampires cavorting through much of film and a good deal of fiction these days are quite happy to be friendly to humans. It could be that they, uh, they feed only on criminals, acting as de facto vigilantes, even superheroes. They may struggle not to bite the object of their romantic interest, an abstinence drama played out without the slightest hint of irony. <laughs> they may protect us from other less scrupulous vampires or from other monsters altogether. Meanwhile, their thirst, that ongoing unceasing dryness in the mouth, that burning in the throat, and its soul relief, blood, hot and coppery, is minimized. We've sentimentalized a predator, turned a tiger who can leap a 12-foot fence and carry off a person into a plush toy fit for a child's bed. Yes, a book such as The Lesser Dead demonstrates that sheer artistic brio can still carry the day. For the moment, though, I'm thinking this monster needs a rest. And, for the love of God, no sparkly vampires. <laughs> Parenthesis. Unless, say, they weren't sparkling, but on fire. <laughs> Not consumed by flame, but afflicted by it, tormented by it. Little tongues of fire flaring on their cheeks, their necks, the backs of their hands, leaving the skin there charred. It's not a part of their normal experience, no. It's the result of something that happened to them the other night while they were attempting to feed. These vampires, there are three of them, are not particularly strong. How could they be? They're walking corpses with an addiction to blood. 
For the same reason, they aren't much on the seduction approach. Although one of them, a young looking man named Harrison Stamp, has heard rumors from other vampires he's met during his travels of clubs in some of the big cities, Manhattan, Chicago, LA, whose members come specifically to be fed upon. Harrison and his comrades have to work in groups, hunt in packs like wolves, coyotes, hyenas. They're constantly on the move, lest a sharp increase in the number of exsanguinated corpses draw the notice of the authorities of a particular locale. Sometimes they luck into an open boxcar on a train that's moving freight from one side of the country to the other. There isn't too much of them to begin with, and if they lie still, especially if they're within or near a patch of shadows, the eye tends to slide right over them. Most of the time when they hunt, they use their affinity for darkness to their advantage, concealing themselves to either side of a path or driveway, then leaping out to ambush their victim. I'm going to stop there. John. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, you can continue to sit around or stand around and talk to everybody and talk to the writers. I don't think anyone brought anything to sell, right? No. Just our bodies. Just yeah. your bodies. I knew you were going to say But if you have any of their books, I'm sure they <laughs> Too bad, too bad. Anyway, see you next month and hang out. Bye. <laughs>